Welcome to, to everyone for this uh, plenary lecture by Daniela De Angelis, who is Deputy Director of the MRC Biostatistics University. I was going to say here in Cambridge, because we're all supposed to be in Cambridge. Um, and just uh, welcome, Daniela, and, and, and uh, give her the floor. Okay, thank you very much. I don't know how many of you there are out there. I, I, uh, I should start by apologising. This has been put together at the very last minute, so I hope you understand. Uh, it's not being rehearsed, so I'm not quite sure exactly how long it's going to last for. But, um, but uh, when Dennis invited me to, to participate, I thought um, maybe silly uh, that I would be able to put together something given the two weeks notice that he'd given me, but at the end it didn't work out so well. But anyway, you, I have a number of slides and, uh, and you'll see the, mm, the, they degrade over time, the quality degrades, so I do apologize for that. Okay, so this is, uh, this is mm, an, an opportunity for me uh, to give you some, some sort of um, feedback or to inform you about the, the latest uh, developments on the COVID pandemic in England. Um, I am one of the members of the um, SPIM group. Uh, in, it's a subgroup of the emergency group uh, of the government the so-called SAGE, and we've been working very hard in the last, I don't remember how long now, but throughout February, March and April, so it's, it's, it's around three months, to provide evidence uh, for decision making. Um, it's, uh, it's been a, um, an interesting, interesting experience. Uh, so um, I've, I've, the idea here is to give you some sort of uh, flavor of, of, of the of the type of work that we've been doing. Um, typically this work is not uh, totally clean and finished as one might like, uh, but the situation is so fastly moving that as Graham Medley says, it's better something uh, now less perfect than something perfect when if it comes too late. So we've been doing a lot of work um, to try and to, to address the problems that, that were coming up and to use the data that accumulate with all these problems. And, and I think this is a, a little bit of a, um, a short history of the last few months. Um, so I'll start. So let me first of all give you a little bit of background. Uh, the background starts roughly 10 years ago with the 2009 pandemic when I was involved uh, in the H1N1 together with the, what was called the, the Health Protection Agency and now it's called Public Health in England. They did have some li limited capacity uh, to, to do any work for that uh, pandemic in terms of uh, uh, monitoring the epidemic the, it was evolving and so uh, a collaboration with the MRC Biostatistics Unit was developed to work to develop methods or model for real-time pandemic monitoring. So the, the original model, which we published then in 2011 uh, in PNAS, was uh, also this type. Let me just describe it very briefly. Uh, it was a deterministic, um, in fact, it's S -I -R -M -E -E -I -R model, uh, which would um, um, govern the transmission of the, the disease. It was an age structured. Uh, then, of course, this is this, mo this process is not observed. What we see is a number of uh, data streams uh, which, uh, which would then inform the estimation of the underlying parameters, reconstruct the epidemic uh, process and, and if necessary, um, predict. Although at that point we were not interested in predicting. Okay, so the, the, the first component was a a, a, a deterministic model for transmission that we had a quite complicated and convoluted model uh, uh, for the observe well, for this disease model and for the observational model, and we had a number of um, data streams which were uh, fit, um, which was feeding into the estimation, which was in a in a Bayesian um, framework. So. 
the, this blue um, uh, these blue um, uh, boxes uh, represent the data streams that we had. They were all incomplete, they were all um, biased, and so we had to use um, additional data sets to, um, to, to make use of, the, of, of what we saw. And then combining uh, um, prior distribution on the parameters of interest, particularly obviously of this lambda AT, um, Together, uh, together with the uh, likelihood, we can derive posterior distribution for the parameters and then estimate the, the epidemic process. Uh, um, just to give you a little bit of a flavor, no, I'm not going to go in, in any details. We had data on uh, case um, um, confirmed cases at the very beginning of the epidemic. Uh, we had information on GP consultations, which obviously had an element of background, so they were very noisy. Um, uh, signal, and then we had information over time on uh, uh, zero prevalence in the population, so a series of snapshots. So this, this was the setup of, 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 of the model uh, in 2011. Now, uh, the question, okay, this is, says exactly what I've just said. The only thing that I didn't say is that this was a Bayesian model and the posterior distribution was uh, uh, was obtained through uh, simulation, uh, Markov chain on the count. So this is the list of the data I've just mentioned. So um, we use this model um, in, in the paper to estimate the, um, the H1N1 uh, pandemic in, in different regions. Here in London, we had an initial zero of 1.72, uh, a total number of infection of 1 million and 33, 27% um, of which were symptomatic. So this, this is basically history. We did the same thing uh, in, in different regions, although uh, we were modeling regional epidemic independent of one another at that point. So, however, this was a retrospective, this work was as a, a, a retrospective epidemic reconstruction, reconstruction. It was not online inference. The regions were analyzed in isolation, and, um, um, and, 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 and there was a potential for, for new data streams to come along for a future uh, uh, epidemic. So we needed to, 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 to develop the model to uh, enable online inference, uh, to maybe model the regions um, simultaneously, so a meta population model, and to use additional data, uh, data sets or data streams which will probably will, uh, will have um, uh, increased the computational time and, uh, and then at the same time uh, pose other problems because data are never really easy to, to use and interpret. So uh, we did apply in, in 2012 for a, a NIHR UK pandemic influenza research portfolio. This was uh, a, a series of uh, so some funding that was made uh, available to people to, to prepare for an eventual pandemic. So, so to do a developmental work in, in such a way that uh, this work, developmental work will be uh, ready as, the, as a new emerging pandemic, as, as a new uh, pandemic um, was emerging in the future. So there was a, a, an initial phase, a pre-pandemic, so um, we did exactly what I've just said. We, we did spatial modeling, uh, incorporation of data from different uh, surveillance schemes. Uh, we, we improve um, uh, the uh, computational aspect to make it in real time. Uh, we did uh, quite a lot of, uh, of developmental work. And of course, within the grant, there was a second phase, a in pandemic phase, where all these projects, ours was one of them, would, uh, would uh, be activated and be ready uh, in the event of a sudden pandemic. And, and for us, this part here was to provide modeling and software support to, to public health in, uh, in the provision of relevant estimation forecast. So, uh, at the, before uh, January 2020, uh, we had published papers developing this tool. Uh, we had a, 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 a software on Gaint. We'd, um, we'd done all sorts of other things. And, um, 
and we thought we were ready at least we 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 even we even uh, we even uh, use this model for uh, seasonal influenza so we kind of tested it um, and so in, pre in principle we were ready but were we really ready um, and this is I think the little story I'm going to tell you uh, or, or about this um, tell you the story of the adaptation of this model to to a different type of epidemic which whose characteristics are still not clear um, and so in a way uh, about the naivety with which we we embark in the COVID to say we've got the tools we can do what is needed i'll give you an idea of the uh, current climate and our participation as pm group I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a, a little bit about this model in some detail and how uh, it's been adapting to the, to the new uh, epidemic and how it was being used to generate evidence in, 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 for decision making before the lockdown. It was used as a simulator to provide scenarios of possible pandemic profiles and after the lockdown it was it was used in the way it was meant to be used as an inferential and prediction tool to provide nowcast and forecast of key epidemiological quantities um, and then i'll tell you about all the tweaks interesting tweaks that we had to make to as they accumulated to to make full use of this of this model then i'll i'll probably if i have time I haven't timed this, so I don't know how, how long I have. Uh, I'll, I'll give you some uh, some ideas of the current challenges. Okay, let me let me just uh, tell you about this uh, scientific pandemic influenza advisory committee SPIM. It was constituted in uh, during the H one N one pandemic in two thousand nine. It is to support Sage, which is the the body that decide makes decisions. Uh, in, a, in, in an emergency situation, and these particular pandemics are emergency, emergency situations. Um, so, so basically, um, SPIM provides um, uh, provides expertise on the uh, quantitative expertise on the analysis of data in the construction of uh, and in the estimation and uh, of transmission dynamics. So anything that has to do with uh, transmission modeling um, is in there. Uh, SPIM was maintained in, after 2009 to ensure preparedness um, in the event of a pandemic. Uh, we will be meeting for the last 10 years at least twice a year, um, if no more. And more recently, uh, I think the last meeting before this pandemic was at the end of November, um, uh, the remit of the spy aim was extended to just influenza because the idea is to prepare for a for a pandemic influenza pandemic um, to extend this remit to to more general um, more general emerging epidemic and it, the the members of the spy aim um drawn from all sort of university i haven't made the list here but we can imagine the, the usual suspects, uh, Imperial College, the London School of Hygiene, uh, Warwick University, Lancaster, Exeter, um, Manchester, um, Edinburgh. So there is a lot of expertise uh, to be to be used in this. Um, and then and then lots of lots of different people were were brought in as uh, as needed throughout, uh, and they are still brought in as as needed. Um, because uh, because the tasks uh, they are given um, coming really fast and they have a very very short uh, uh, short not a uh, uh, very short notice and and uh, for most of the period that we've been working uh, we've been working with a deadline of forty eight hours so you need lots of resources to be able to cope with with this type of, of demand okay so let me. Let me sort of generically explain a little bit about that model that I've described uh, initially, and uh, and uh, this is a, an age stratified, uh, stratified um, trans, uh, deterministic models 
which has got two substates for the latent and infection periods. Um, these are, this is the continuous time formulation. It, um, it, it, it's, it's quite a simple model, it's not very complicated. Uh, the force of infection is uh, in, particularly, in particular um, a function of this um, matrix, which is the metric of contents, content matrix, which changes over time. And in this situation, it's, it's, it's actually a very important concept. So the new infections, um, this is, um, this is um, okay, in the new infections are uh, generating in this way, STA is the, um, is the number susceptible at a particular time on a particular age group, and P lambda T is, is the probability of infection given by this uh, expression here. Um, this is a read frost formulation, MTAB is the A, A, B entry in the age group time bearing mixing matrix. Uh, R0 is uh, R star is a scaling factor. R0 is the, uh, is, the um, um, is, is the reproduction number and so we use the wearing formulation so we express it in terms of the growth, uh, the, the growth, the exponential growth rate. Um, yeah, and, and here DL and DI I are the, uh, the, 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 the times, um, the, the parameters, and, and, and so they indicate the time spent in the, in the, in the latent and infectious uh, um, state. So um, this is the typical matrix that you can imagine um, po from Polymond. So the initial time zero uh, is, is this, which describes the daily average content that each individual or, or a particular, in a particular age strata has with another individual in a particular, in a different uh, um, age group. Um, this is, was the initial uh, metrics, uh, but then of course, uh, after the lockdown, uh, the, the metrics of content changed. And we were able to, to, to derive um, uh, the other metrics by uh, using information from Google Mobility and uh, in time use surveys. Okay, so this is, uh, this is basically the structure of the model. And uh, with this type of model, you can do different things. And there was uh, an initial phase uh, where uh, the model was used as a simulator just to create possible scenarios. This was at the very beginning of February when uh, uh, obviously it was clear that something is happening in China uh, maybe there were some already some episodes in in Europe. Maybe some uh, some uh, cases have been uh, uh, have been confirmed. You may imagine. You may re recall the, the the famous cluster in in, um, in Germany, and and the, and there were already uh, initial people uh, uh, confirmed in, in in the UK. Uh, but uh, although there were imported infection, and I was clear with. Uh, the, there was a Chinese, uh, a Chinese couple, mother and son, in York, uh, and then they were uh, announced to be positive at the end of um, at the end of January. So by the beginning of uh, of February, there was a, a there was already a, a lot of movement, a lot of uh, activation um, in terms of um, sort of political and uh, and um, scientific uh, the, the, in the political scientific world, and in particular, this, the famous uh, spy M uh, met on the twenty seventh of, uh, of uh, January, and, and and they gave one of the initial tasks. So one of the the tasks that we we, we were given uh, using this model is to generate possible um, possible scenario or what an epidemic in this country would look like if the um, if it had the same characteristics as uh, as China 
So uh, that's what we did. And uh, if you remember the expression here of R0, um, um, we, we basically used data uh, coming from China, uh, not really data, estimates of, uh, of, uh, import, or, or, of um, the serial interval and, and um, I think it was the serial interval, the incubation time, and basically uh, the, the, um, the relevant parameters which were already being estimated by a number of groups in China to, produ to pro produce possible um, epidemic. So um, we took the um, interval, uh, so the, the cellular estimate in the interval as if there were sort of a range uh, from which to estimate to, to to sample the various parameters di, uh, dl, and uh, and the um, and the growth curve, and we generating possible Rs. Then having generated possible Rs, we generated all the infections that uh, resulted. And uh, I don't know how well you can see this uh, this this plot here, uh, but this is uh, uh, basically an example of the resulting epidemics um, in a situation where I think we started with, uh, with 100, um, 100 um, um, infected individuals, um, and, yeah, 100 individuals. So we're generating this epidemic and you can see, perhaps you can or can, you cannot see, but the dark, the dark uh, um, color correspond to the very high, um, uh, R0 and then the uh, the red ones to to a smaller R0 and you can you can see that the level of infections which you know, is difficult to read here um, was uh, was very high and the epidemic would uh, would uh, be extinguished very quickly if the R was uh, uh, was very high whereas for for R for an epidemic characterized by an R which was lower uh, there was a longer duration in the smaller peak. Uh, see if I if I remember uh, the the level of um, infection, but you're talking about mil um, you know sort of millions a day. So the the, the question that was asked was the magnitude, and this gives you an idea depending on the R, the uh, the peak. This is a, a distribution on the peak and and the duration. So this this was the the kind of uh, information that they wanted. What kind of, of, of epidemic are we going to, to expect if it um, has the same characteristics? So with the, us, like everyone else, did lots of simulation to try to understand the regional profiles, um, age profiles, um, to try to understand whether, for instance, there would be a synchrony between different regions, which obviously depended on, on the type of seeding, um, so there was a, a, a quite a lot of work directing uh, in this way to try to understand what the potential pandemic could uh, would look like, and this was at the very a very initial part of uh, of February, and in in time uh, and over time in the in those early days uh, there, there was an, a lot of work to try to understand whether there was established transmission anywhere. In the meantime, uh, this is a data set called the FF100, so the first few hundred. Uh, this is a study that was uh, initially set up in, the, in 2009 and then of course um, uh, activated, uh, reproduced again uh, now by Public Health England and, and the idea is that of the initial confirmed individuals identified, which initially were all uh, um, mainly um, people who, who had come back from uh, from China, uh, they would uh, track uh, the um, the possible uh, contents and they would test them. and And so this data sent to so the study was to to identify and all the contents, they would follow up all the contents and uh, and understand whether they wouldn't develop symptoms and then so on and so forth. So there were you can see here, that uh, throughout uh, February and the beginning of, of, of March, um, uh, this was the, the number of confirmed individuals, um, all of them. So you, there were not very many, 
and and you can see that um, there were mainly um, sort of people returning from from other countries so not important the number of not imposes was was quite small and it seemed to be almost going down but it wasn't really going down we discover at that point that there was a reporting delay and this is the same the same uh, curve that i showed earlier and this is the uh, the numbers adjusted for reported delay uh, i mean uh, admittedly we didn't put and i didn't have a, a picture where there was a, a, com a confidence interval here but you wouldn't want to do that so actually the scale was quite different once the reporting delay had been adjust uh, had been accounted for the 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 curve in the first few hundred was uh, it was showing some trend okay so much so that we could even uh, fit um, a, an exponential curve and, and this was the very early stages where the testing and, and the tracing and testing was uh, was quite homogeneous so it wasn't changing over time there was a there was a, a a policy to do that so what you would see was actually the result of a of a sort of a consistent uh, continue, consistent policy on testing and it was evidence of this type a work uh, by others uh, in early March um, predicting that the NHS would be overwhelmed by the number of resulting hospitalization in, uh, and uh, um, admission to uh, ICU and uh, that uh, trigger the lockdown so this is the kind of work that we were doing using uh, the, the, the model uh, initially and then we were doing also data analysis to try to understand whether there was any initial sign of a established um, a transmission in this country. So we arrived under lockdown. Now, after the lockdown, uh, our model uh, was used for you know fully for its purpose so now casting so reproduction uh, reconstruction of the epidemic uh, estimation of the parameters and understanding the level of infection at the current time and then it was used to forecast um, relevant data now what kind of data are we talking about we're talking about time series of, of confirmed cases uh, which was reliable before there were changes in testing strategy and I think the testing strategies was well, did change around about mid March. Then we had time series of deaths uh, of people who, been, uh, who had been confirmed as being positive COVID. Then much later on, uh, you might have heard uh, an awful lot about this, the serological uh, data on, um, on in, in immunity or, or antibodies and, and there, are, there are at the moment lots of studies but we decided to adopt to use the data on the blood transfusion and all, all data were stratified by age group and by NHS regions. Now it's not quite the, 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 the rich uh, data set or data streams or collection of data streams that we had envisaged and that we had planned for uh, perhaps even uh, done, uh, um, not perhaps, and done the, um, the developmental work for, but that's what was available at that time. At that time, it is available now actually. So, um i've um i've um, i've kind of reconstructed i hope it's not too boring for you some sort of little um timeline uh, so important points were the data uh, the availability of the data or the problems uh, in the data required um required some sort of different um I mean evolution of the model. Initially uh, data was, uh, the data were very limited and so we couldn't do uh, any full, um, I mean the, the, the model would, wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't make sense to, 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 to exploit all the various flexible uh, aspects of the model by age, by age for instance, by, by region. So we started with a much reduced model which uh, is, uh, used the data 
uh, initially um, initially uh, available and then as data were coming through or becoming richer and accumulating uh, we could uh, we could uh, analyze things in much more de detail and and, uh, and and adopt a model which was uh, becoming more um, more realistic over time. So, for instance, uh, in March, we said the lockdown was 23rd, and I think around those days, we started to, to use our model uh, um, in a, as a, as a, um, as a, an estimation tool, as an inferential tool. Um, so uh, we we used the data and uh, we couldn't understand no we couldn't estimate the effect of the lockdown um, so I'll, I'll show you what we did instead and we were looking just at London outside London again because the data were limiting and, and it wouldn't allow any any particular um, stratification by region by the 29 by the, the end of March we had decided that um, then we would use only the data and we dropped the um, the, the line listing. Let me just uh, go back for a second to this. I said there were confirmed cases, there were dense and this, the serological samples. These are the data that we used. In reality, there were many more um, um, many more streams which we did not consider and uh, this were the hospitalization and the uh, admission to ICU um, which uh, they came more in terms of uh, the number of people in hospital and the number of people in ICU so cross-sectional data rather than incidence data there was a way of, of uh, deriving some sort of heavy measure of the incident, but it wasn't it wasn't so 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 neat. Also, those data, uh, according to me, to us, uh, could uh, could suffer from uh, changes in policy or admission to hospital, and, and so we were not quite clear uh, whether you know we could uh, actually uh, account for that, and so trends could have been masked. Uh, by by changing policies, which could have been different, and I think there is a little bit of evidence that those changes were were different in different regions. So we decided not to use uh, the hospitalization data, not to use the ICU data, and so we were um, we were deciding we decided to just um, use the death data, uh, neat and strong single si signal. Of course, a little bit delayed compared to the other data sets. Anyway, so this was March. Uh, come to to April, we started uh, to 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 accrue more data, so we can we can actually develop a regional model. Uh, we can uh, start estimating the lockdown effect. Remember that our model is a Bayesian model, so the uh, lockdown effect was through a, a particular type of parameters parameter which uh, initially had a, a very strong prior because there was not very much uh, in information on it so we we progressively able to to relax the prior and and, and lend the data speak and then on the 13th we we did the, we 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 starting to look at the uh, model age specific model given that again data were accumulating and uh, and we could uh, use the uh, use the uh, age stratifying data. Uh, also, the content matrix uh, was allowed to change over time from the initial polymond. As I said, uh, the we 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 were acquiring slowly um, data on uh, movement, and so we could uh, formulate a new uh, matrix, which then uh, which then also started to account for some of the the um for, for some of the effect in 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 transmission in change in transmission on the 16th with uh, with also um elaborated a little bit uh, about the um the time to death uh, because obviously what we were using uh, it was um, any information about IFR so the infection um, infection mortality uh, fatality ratio and and 
is here and uh, and the time the distribution of the time from symptom to onset to death this 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 kind of information on the severity were initially taken uh, from the chinese but uh, they soon soon by mint april they revealed themselves no appropriate and um, and uh, uh, it, it, with with the result that, that that we were getting really strange uh, results uh, from 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 the estimation um, um, like uh, all, the whole population uh, by the, by this time uh, must have been infected. So there was something not quite right. All of this seems to be automatic, but it's not. If you think that. This, uh, this kind of results were provided every 48 hours and you only had really a short time to, to assess whether they made sense or not. So as we were progressing, we were changing, tweaking the, the model to, to, to be able to, um, to reproduce the data. And, and some of the data were suggesting that some of the initial assumptions we were making were not appropriate. And this was the case here. May, come May, which uh, is very, it's last week, but uh, it seems already a long time ago. But we started to to use the data on the uh, on the serological data from the blood donation, donation from blood donors. So we had some information which was age and region specific on the proportion of um, of the population uh, who had antibodies. And uh, and then again last week we started to to see whether we could uh, estimate the effect of a relax relaxation. Let me go into some details. The the complicated model that you saw at the very beginning with lots of lots of uh, data sets actually is much simpler now. So we uh, this indicates the the incidence and the parameters are informed by um, in the initial set of uh, the, the initial data on on the um, on the confirmed cases it didn't last very long as I just told you and then from uh, on the side on the dents the time series of dents and therefore uh, the probability of dying and in the time and the time from onset or from infection you can reconstruct it and from infection to death and then later on more recently using the seroprevalence data which gives some information on the um on on the on the proportion susceptible still susceptible in the population now one very interesting problem is um is the data and this 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 um uh, ex this figure uh, shows a quite well if you can see it is um this is the counts of death by date of death uh, uh, at the end of um, march uh, at the end of march uh, by region in this case at this time we were only looking at uh, london outside london but you can see what the problem is the the, the serious reporting delay uh, that we we were um, experiencing so uh, not only the data, um, the deaths are a delayed uh, signal, but we also needed either to estimate the reporting delay and adjust again this also by reporting delay. Uh, so, so um, which which meant obviously we had to sort of um, scale up the last few days at least, uh, or uh, ignore the information in the last few days. Now, it, mm, this is another seminar to, to give the problems about the adjustment of reporting delay because the reporting was very, very, very extremely haphazard and not very easy to estimate. Uh, and so it, it, any method, existing method, was really not appropriate. It was giving an awful lot of variability um, and it was very, very dependent on on the on the reporting pattern, which was changing um, basically by the by the day. So we had to to ignore uh, as a safe um, as a safe op option here. We had to ignore even few more days to avoid um, to get rid of the bias due to the reporting delay. Okay, so this is, these are the data that we initially uh, used. In, in the initial 23rd or 20, 23rd of March, 
that I've just mentioned at the beginning. So we had this line listing with the uh, confirmed cases. It, 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 uh, these were uh, uh, affected by reporting delay as well. You can see um, these are the data. The blue are the data to the 23rd and uh, and in the red the data to the 20th and you can see that um, the case count for instance uh, we only uh, we only use them up to a point this um, because they were affected um, by reporting delay and the same thing here data comparison okay so uh, what did we do um, we fitted the model using uh, the two streams we estimated the parameters and um, and we, um, we we trying to reconstruct the underlying um, the underlying um, terms. Uh, of course, the, there was a, a big uncertainty in the impact of the of the lockdown. So what we did, we generated a high, mean, medium, and low impact scenario to extend the estimation of the epidemic curve be, before uh, uh, beyond the the, the lockdown. I, I just wanted to to say that at this stage, these are these are the the uh, the curves uh, corresponding to to the medium to the high, low, and medium effect. I think the the low effect was a twenty four percent reduction in, in transmission. The high was sixty four, and the, in the mid was forty eight. You might wonder where we got these numbers from, but they were. Uh, they were informed by information by, by some data on content tracing, uh, content um, on content metrics or contents between um, you know the metrics or contents uh, literature. So the, this was uh, uh, this was a reconstruction of the number of new infections. Obviously, the impact of the uh, the, the, the value of uh, the impact of the lockdown would make an enormous difference. Uh, if uh, if the impact had been low, then we would have observed at least that's what we reconstructed uh, and predicted a, a a very high peak uh, around about we're talking about three million here uh, uh, with a very high we would have possibly uh, sort of diminished uh, the the number of infection, but still uh, you know the uncertainty was quite big up to. A, a number, these are data are base, so up to uh, 1 million. And in the mean, there was, some, was something between suggesting uh, a peak, but wind again, very, very big, uh, uncertain on the number of daily infections. And, and, the, and the pattern was different, obviously, in London and outside London. But at this point, this was just driven by very very initial data by as uh, um, information information by assumptions on the possible lockdown which we didn't have enough data to 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 estimate and so was was just giving a, a, a very imp a clear impression that the data were not really saying very much about the the current and perhaps uh, short-term um, um, evolution of the epidemic anyway just let me let me let me go to to the next step to enter the end of March when we started to have a little bit more information about uh, about the um, the change uh, the lockdown effect the data were accumulating um, so we could we could put in, in extra parameters which we call M1 here um, to which uh, in, initially there was a, a tight prior because obviously the data were not enough to be able to estimate it, but this wouldn't represent the um, a, the, the, the effect uh, on on the probability of infection of the lockdown. And you can see that uh, you know we were the tight prior that we were using initially was centered around forty percent, and then later on we'll start we will start um, using something which is much um, much more relaxed and let the data speak. So th this was the way we introduced uh, the effect of the lockdown. Uh, of course, this M M one was uh, was um, 
it, it, it was kept the same only at, at the level of one parameter until the second, the, the, the lifting of the lockdown uh, the, the week la before last. And then the idea would be to be able to try to identify uh, uh, whether this, this type of parameter changes over time, we'll see. Okay, so uh, again, um, this is, this is pre uh, progressing our, uh, our estimation and our prediction. At the moment, we are I'm just concentrating on, on the now casting, so understanding where the, uh, where the, the level of infection is. Um, in the, in the, small, um, the most small window here, you can see the trends in the, in the, in the number of deaths. I'm not sure that you can read the, the region, but of course there was a there was an increase, and the increase was uh, was different different regions. And I think the the yellow one here is, is actually London. So the number of deaths were quite steeply steeply um, steeply increasing in London. In other regions, I think this is the Midlands, and in other regions the, the rate of increase was uh, was much slower. So um, there was a, an heterogeneity. Uh, we started to be able to to identify this heterogeneity when we started using a regional specific uh, model. And you can see that this is, for instance, reconstructing epidemic in London uh, with, uh, with a peak uh, round about, you know, so the, the, the lockdown and the effect of the, of the lockdown was, was that of uh, uh, suppressing uh, the infection, but the uncertainty was, uh, was still uh, very big. This is, these are uh, daily uh, new infections. They, uh, the, 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 there was heterogeneous, I said, for instance, Northeast and the Yorkshire, the, the picture was quite, uh, was quite different. Uh, the level uh, in the, before the, the, the lockdown was, uh, the level of infection before, before the lockdown was estimated to be uh, much lower, therefore the effect was smaller and, and there was the, the possible uh, the possibility of, of having lots of infections after uh, afterwards. Um, what's interesting is that the the R zero was being estimated as uh, between two point four and three point five in different regions, and the M one parameters was of the order of um, thirty five, not point thirty five. So this indicating that uh, the, 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 the effect of, of, of the lockdown, uh, although it was quite um, uncertain, could be, uh, could be estimated. But um, I think at this point, we still had the, um, the strong prior. Okay, so now we, we started to acquire more and more information on, on patterns of um, of content between age groups and and from the original uh, polymond the, we we could derive um, uh, new matrices using data from mobility and using data on uh, the time spent in different activities it's, it again is is a little bit of a tricky calculation to explain how it was done but uh, we we could trace uh, we could adopt different metrics uh, matrices over time, and I think this were it were changing uh, every week, and the, therefore they were absorbing or explaining some of, of some of the, the the transmission. So perhaps at this from this point on, the value of this M uh, parameter wasn't so um, clear. It wasn't the, the one that was absorbing all the difference, and it was it could be interpreted now more like. Um, um, a contribution to the change in transmission uh, beyond uh, the change in content, which could be formalized and, and expressed in terms of these matrices. So, so a, a kind of um, a random effect, if you like, although uh, it, it, it wasn't a, a random effect, but it would, would account for all the, the, the remaining, uh, uh, um, remaining unaccounted um, variation in, in transmission. So we end number of, of matrices. This is, for instance, the one uh, that we were using um, the week of the 30th uh, and then at the beginning of, uh, of April and then uh, here 
I think is, is in May. And we have these matrices every week. Okay. Now, uh, as uh, we're, um, you know, we, we, at the beginning of April, we, we had a trend, an increasing trend in deaths. And slowly, slowly, you know, we started to, to, to observe declining trends, particularly in London, uh, where the other, the other, um, uh, the other uh, um, regions maybe uh, were still um, having sort of so constant, uh, constant number of deaths. Um, this is, was the 26th of April. Uh, you can see that we, we, we were even changing the way we visualizing uh, our results. Um, now we had an RT, which was, um, which was obviously changed by, through the, uh, through the metrics and, and, uh, through the, uh, to the M factor. Uh, we were estimating something between 0.5 and 0.75. Remember that before uh, the lockdown, we were talking about uh, a, 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 a R0 of you know, 2.4, maybe reaching three in some of the regions. We were estimating uh, uh, an, a, an infection finality ratio of 15% over for those over 75, and uh, and then and then differential in different uh, in different age groups. This is where we were fully um, um, using the data by age or the age structure. So again, uh, uh, usual uh, heterogeneity. Lando was the one that uh, seemed to have been uh, experiencing a, a much earlier epidemic, and and other places like the the northeast and Yorkshire were still. Uh, at this stage, uh, having uh, ten, you know, over the 10,000 uh, um, infection, infection per day, and, 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 and the pattern was, was, was different. The pattern infection in the past was different. Now, we come to, to our um, to much closer uh, date. This was the, the 10th of May. And uh, this is what um, uh, what the uh, what the the the, de the deaths looked like at this stage. You might have um, you might have heard all the uh, all the, the the media storm that we were subject to um, last week. Um, you know uh, the, the the epidemic seems to be sort of almost fainting in, in London, whereas uh, in, uh, in other areas, again, it's, uh, it's still ongoing. We were uh, estimating very low uh, RT in London and 24 daily infection, we can, we can talk about that. Uh, the RT was, was uh, between 0 0.64 and 0.8 elsewhere. Um, in, variable in different different regions but definitely uh, lower than one so um, I mean the LFR is still high in those uh, over 75 and um, it, it basically you know the, the, this uh, this this introduced for us uh, it confirmed for us the heterogeneity in different regions which perhaps uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's due to a number of factors, maybe the, the level of infection before the lockdown, but at the same time, uh, the, uh, the different social structure maybe uh, and, uh, um, and, and comorbidities that uh, characterize individuals in different regions. So that's where we are now. Um, uh, just this is just to give you an idea because apart from reconstructing the epidemic, we were also um, uh, estimating and uh, forecasting the, the the number of of, of deaths, and um, seems to be that we've been quite successful uh, um, at um, at forecasting uh, the, the the mortality due to due to COVID. Now um, the our work continues. 
uh, I hope I'll, I'll, uh, I've been able to give you some, some sort of flavor of the things that have been going on, how we progress our model, what the diverse different components have been added over time, and, uh, and, and where we are now. We are in a situation where we, it, it, the, the restriction being relaxed, and now we have to identify whether this, uh, this have, has led to any research in the number of infections, uh, which is a, a very, very difficult uh, mission. So the current challenges now is, um, it, is, I mean, the main one is the ability to track this time varying M and um, uh, whether, whether this, uh, the, the, the data actually are uh, informative enough to be able to say anything about the current transmission. Um, because remember that uh, the, the lifting or the reinstitution of, uh, of uh, restriction, um, social, social distance or, or, or whatever, uh, it depends on, on the scientists, that's what uh, they say, but the science is, uh, is, is, is limiting the art tools, um, individual are not enough to be able to perhaps to, to identify um, swift changes in transmission. We could um, we could be using additional data. Uh, we have already a, a, a serological uh, incorporated serological data in the in our model, and this is being shown to be very consistent with the estimates that we were obtaining. So um, it, it hasn't led to um, a big change, um, and you you might have seen. The results uh, of these uh, serological um, um, serological surveys, which indicate uh, that you know uh, quite quite a proportion of, of of young people have been infected, for instance, and so which which then poses the question about uh, age dependent susceptibility and transmissibility, which is not at all understood. Now we have a measure of the prevalence rather than the zero prevalence, so the current level of infection from the ONS study, but this is still, uh, um, the, the information is still very uncertain, but we, st we are thinking uh, that th these, are, these are additional information that we we couldn't, uh, this is part of the additional information we couldn't um, introduce in our, in our model, but whether we'll be able to swiftly, given the delayed uh, nature of the, of, the, of the death state, we'll be able to, to, to swiftly identify any change is, is perhaps doubtful. And, and our work, like the work of others, will need to be accompanied by other other tools and not just uh, and not just um, rely on on the on the models. I don't 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 because there are so many questions that we don't even know how to formulate. I just uh, finish with the acknowledgement. Uh, Public Health England, who has been a, a obviously a, a collaborator in that uh, through Paul and doing. And, uh, and the PHE modeling cell and the uh, um, MRC Biostatistics Union poll is, 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 is a double affiliation. And Joshua Blake, that, who is, a, who is a, a first year PhD student starting with me and Paul uh, in, uh, in October and has is, is been sort of, um, you know, experiencing, making a very interesting experience in his six, first six months of a PhD student. Anne Presan is, is another colleague who's involved in the estimation of the, um, of the severity um, of, of COVID-19. So um, I, I hope I haven't bored you too much. I hope I've given you a flavor of, of the challenges that are our work. That we are only one of the possible groups uh, um, um, in uh, working in SPIM. There are lots of others and um, and that's it. I don't know whether you have questions. Thank you. Well, thank, you think, thank you very much. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't realize how time was passing by so quickly. Anyway. Uh, Arno, can we unshare the screen possibly? Mm.
I had um, just, just one question about about sort of spatial structure. I'm not sure whether that's um, at the. Um, uh, did did you did you just uh, were you con the main thing you seemed to have had was was to be considering different regions separately? Was that the only sort of level of spatial structure, or did you look at no, more? No, it, wasn't, it wasn't. I didn't say that. But uh, initially, uh, initially we were we were fitting the data by region on individual uh, regions. But then some some of the parameters would be uh, common to all regions, so we were fitting the, the region simultaneously. And, and some of the parameters were, um, were considered common, so there was a hierarchical model which, uh, which, um, which we used to, to, to model those parameters. Common, different, but from a common distribution. No, they were fitting uh, simultaneously. Okay, uh, Ara Longini has a question. Analyst, you allowed to? Now, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah, I can hear you. Uh, I don't see much, but that's okay. Uh, very nice for that presentation. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, you know, why you use a compartmental model, differential equations model, rather than an agent-based model, uh, especially for evaluating the effect of the lockdown. Uh, and then lifting it, uh, you know, having a single M that multiplies the uh, the tr uh, the mat transmission matrix seems, you know, not very good. Uh, you know, with an agent-based model, you can uh, you know model households and quarantines and contact tracing and all, all these things. And uh, I, I'm just, I you know, I'm a little. Uh, I wonder uh, if you can really uh, deal with the effects of, say, lifting the lockdown in such a simple model. Okay. Um, I, first of all, it, I, I, well, I said that. Uh, I mean, what was done in forty-eight hours was what <laughs> could be done in forty-eight hours. So. Uh, in in the days where we didn't we didn't have uh, a, a task, we could uh, think a little bit about uh, extending the model. In reality, uh, we we are uh, putting some we're modeling that thing as a process. Um, so it is not just uh, it's not just a, a, a it's, it's not just a value that a, a stepwise value, uh, you know, uh, so there is more to it than that. Um, the the agent-based model, I mean, the, the big simulation model is the simulation model that people in um, Imperial College use. I'm, I'm, I'm not that keen on those models. I find that uh, it's very difficult to, to do inference in those models and they're very much dependent on what you put in uh, in the model in the first place. So um, I totally agree, and maybe you didn't say that, but I would, uh, I would put it as a, as a, as, as a caveat. I, I agree that perhaps a, a deterministic model is not quite as flexible as we would like. So I would like to be able to inject uh, some stochasticity, stochasticity in this model, but I, I don't think I would um, I would leave the mean field. I wouldn't I wouldn't go on to uh, on to the edge based model, agent based models because I'm I'm not quite sure how how the a, a, a principal uh, inference can be done. I'm, I'm I'm still I'm still I still need to be convinced about that. Okay. I think with the MCMC methods and uh, you know, other, other uh, Bayesian methods, you can fit these models quite nicely, the data. Uh, but uh, I agree that uh, there's a lot more complexity with agent-based models. Very. I mean, in this situation, they will be ideal, and they are ideal. But, uh, but the, the things I've seen, which is mainly, is mainly scenarios. Yeah. Uh, but what about uh, Martina Morris is going to tell me how to do it now? Um, yeah. I'd, I'd, be, I'd be lovely, uh, 
but I find it I find it difficult to to believe how we go about it. But I'm prepared to to be convinced and to learn from someone how to do it. Go. Uh, well, Mar Martina and Valerie had questions, but perhaps we better have Martina first, as uh, she's uh, been spotted. <laughs> Um, I'm hardly going to tell you how to do it, uh, but what I was going to suggest was there's maybe a middle ground here. So I, I'd like to I echo Iris' point, obviously. I am coming in from that perspective, but primarily because the questions that we need to answer moving forward, I think, require a little bit more than just a single contact reduction value, right? So the, the key questions, I think, are where do we need, where would we get the biggest bang for the buck by really focusing our intervention effort? So closing schools, reducing workplace uh, stuff, uh, large mass social gatherings. Those are actually real questions that people need answers to at this point. So having a single age structured matrix doesn't answer that. But then as soon as I thought about that, I realized, you know, in the polymod data, they actually break down where that age structuring is coming from. Is that is it possible for you to uh, bring that into to, to introduce that heterogeneity into the framework yeah. you're using? Yeah, see, so this is uh, this is all hidden behind these matrices that I have uh, that I've presented. I didn't go in, into any details, but basically, not only you can do that, you can uh, break the. Uh, I think you you can. Uh, you can look at the places um, and, and you can look at schools, you can look at... Um, uh, workplace, yeah. Yes, 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 you can do that. And this is exactly what we're doing. It's, uh, I, I should have given it just a seminar on that, but uh, this is exactly what we're doing. We're looking not just at the original um, and doing... But the aggregate, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so we... We're looking at uh, uh, using the or the, the poly mode in a specifying that way and using the mobility, with, which is, gives us some information about uh, the location of people and how this, this grouping changes over time. And then we are also looking at, um, at the time spent in different, uh, in different um, activity. So it's still a bit, uh, I, it could be made more flexible, I think, but, but basically, the, the, the change in behavior is not just it, 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 through the, these M values. In fact, the, more, the, the, the behavior is more and more explained uh, by the changing metrics over time. Okay, mm -hmm. so the, the M is, is just mm -hmm. an additional bit. Yeah. But I think uh, it's still a uh, compartmental model, so you're still just multiplying factors times matrices. Yeah, no matter how you slice it, uh, it's not going to capture the, uh, you know, say the effect of, of closing a school, for example. And yeah, they give you some proportional representation. Yeah, yeah. I, I really think uh, it's a slippery slope to start breaking these matrices up in this way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, we are. Uh, Valerie, did you have a... Oh, um, a very little one. So could I just say first how much I enjoyed your talk, Danny? It was great. So thank you very much indeed for your efforts in doing it at even two weeks' notice, given all the, the other things well, that did, you're doing at the moment. I put it together this afternoon, so... <laughs> well, there you are then. Um, so this is just... A, 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 I was just curious, really. Uh, as you may know, we had a talk from Neil Ferguson a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the things I, I think I remember from there was a current estimate of the reproduction number or the, the range uh, going up, you know, the idea that it's it been increasing very recently and was now the upper limit of his range was 0.95. Now your calculations were based on data to May 10. And so I wondered if you knew how, what the changes were based on your model the uh, direction of travel really which model is he talking about he's talking about the well that i can't remember of course i just you know it was just some i didn't take notes i mean so exactly what he used for that calculation i don't know so well, I, i'm i'm really just asking if yeah. you if you could add another week's data which you might have done by now yeah. um how much has it changed okay so um 
Uh, I have to say these matrices that we track every, every week are already showing a change. So the number, the, 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 the thing which I summarize in a very simplistic way that of the, the number of the average number um, of uh, the number of contents um, daily actually is changing over time. So that is going to already tell us something. The problem is that the problem is that the deaths are delayed. Sure, uh, sure. So, so if you think about it, they takes you know it takes roughly two weeks on average to die. So the, <laughs> God. I mean, is a neat, is a neat, uh, a solid signal, but is a, is a signal which is delayed, if you see what I mean. So we have problem with that, and we thought that perhaps using the zero prevalence would help. But even the zero prevalence it doesn't really particularly help because it refers to it takes two or three weeks to mm. develop antibodies. So again, it is retrospective. It, it, it sort of informs the past. So we. We we will, and I think we have. Uh, <coughs> your your calculations on on the the ones that you showed us the results for on May the tenth. They of course were were also retrospective and looking back. No, they, they, even the ones that we ran two two days ago, they yeah. are doing a little bit of resurgence. But what does that mean? Mm. When what is the value of what is the value? <laughs> ago? Is sure. the value two weeks ago? Uh, this is a long, long discussion that we're having um, as PyM because obviously different people use different data sets, different delays, therefore, and um, it's not quite clear exactly what everyone is estimating. Neil is estimating that through a, they, they, they use two, two types of um, model, the uh, agent-based model where mm -hmm. you know everything about everyone. And then uh, the other one, uh, I think, is a complemental stochastic model. And for them, the uncertainty in the estimation of the RT is so big, they really definitely spans one, but so big uh, that I, I'm not quite sure how can 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 say that there is a change over time. I just, I'm not sure. It, it's, a, it's a problematic thing. I, between you and I, um, maybe it wasn't the best choice of uh, metric. I just, it was something that intuitively could be appealing the government because it was a number, but but the interpretation is uh, is uh, is very delicate. So maybe that, together with other measures, the other indicators like um, the current prevalence, uh, the current prevalence, or other measures of movement uh, and in in and the testing and the testing and the the tracking, the testing individuals and the results of that put together should be used as a, as a kind of um, composite uh, indicator or measure of the, of the resurgence or not. We're, it's difficult. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not playing with, with models and we're not, you know, it's, it's a difficult situation. I'm sorry. Um, sure. It's sure. No, I appreciate that. It's, but it's good to hear you, you know, expand it. Thank you. Oh. Martina again. If, is there no one else? I put my hand up in case there's no one else. But there is no one else at the moment. Okay. Well, no. good. Then I will jump in. So um, I just want to uh, thank you for bringing up the focusing on R. I mean, it's such a gorgeous, simple summary of this incredibly complex process. We all get fascinated by it, but it is slightly problematic when you hold it up as the one thing that mm -hmm. government should be looking at. And the other thing that I think we fail to adequately um, explain is that when you're close to the threshold, which is where we are, yeah. the stochastic variability becomes very important, right? And so it's exactly there that we have the, the most uncertainty about what's going to happen next. And we could bounce around for some significant period of time there. I, I totally agree with you. And, and, uh, and um, yeah, yeah, you could have said better than that. Yeah, I, I, I really don't know who advised that, frankly. I don't know. I suspect it may have been something like, it was one of the first things that we as modelers wanted to estimate 
And when people started asking us, you know, what should we be looking at? This was what came out. This is what we would want to know as modelers, right? It's kind of the single summary metric. And you can, the beautiful thing is you can estimate it in all of these different ways, right? So it seemed as though there was a, there was a grounding there of it in empirical data that would also allow us to, to get some view into this big invisible epidemic that was unfolding around us. I suppose if you were to, if you were able to rely on, on a very consistent um, a very consistent surveillance, yeah, which then over time really uh, meaningfully represents um, what's happening in the population. I mean, it, it, some of those... That's, that's the classic, assume you have a can opener, right? Yes, exactly. So, uh, so some of those countries that have adopted testing, tracing and testing uh, in a very in a very organized and a very consistent way, would have, would have had data which might have been lending themselves better than, uh, than what was happening here um, to, to, to be able to derive some estimates of, of our. But here, we, we just look at hospitaliz data on hospitalizations, data on deaths. I, I really don't know. Um, so one last follow-up then. What would you suggest if we, if if we could put our back in the closet, which I'm not sure we can, what would you suggest that we put in its place as? I, I don't think you, you want to put it in the closet, no. I think you want to try and see whether you can, you can uh, you, I mean, whether, you, you can try and estimate it, okay? And different groups are coming up with slightly different things, which we don't understand whether it's, it's the, depends on the data they use or, or, or the method they use, or the model they use, uh, the assumptions. I mean, there are lots of things, but it it, it needs to be looked at uh, uh, along with other measures. I was saying before, these are all imperfect measures of everything because the data are not rich enough to be able to 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 give a strong signal of what's going on. If the ONS, for instance, was was uh, were, were bigger. The, the ONS study, um, maybe a, a more clear signal could come from that. Let's see what happens in the next few weeks. Um, the, um, the, the mobile apps and all of that, all of that uh, to, to, to understand uh, the, the mixing, social mixing and, and, and to guide the, 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 the testing and the isolation it, it is biased because obviously it depends on wh who downloads those hubs, how the apps are, are, are utilized. I mean, all these measures have got problems. So the idea is that there's a moment of uncertainty and we've got different things of limited value that in themselves can tell you something, but on their own cannot. So I, I, I don't know, we should look at different, different types of, of uh, of indicators. I mean, the fact that people start going to a hospital, I mean, obviously it's a, it's a, it's a measure of the, the severity, something's going on, okay? But it could be at the same time a measure of the fact that now there are places, so the, there is no overwhelming. So how do you distinguish between the, the true signal due to the epidemic and the, and, and, and the com confounding, which, which depends on other types of consideration and policies, it's very difficult. But if you do have a suggestion, it, um, you know, please come forward because obviously everyone is, is now start, I mean, is, is just thinking of how to go about it. Uh, for instance, creating surveys in particular groups of the population. Okay, we know that there is, there is a hospital uh, epidemic, so that is pretty, you know, obvious. There, we know that there is an epidemic in care homes and institutions. Okay, let's uh, survey that. But what about the community? What about the community? Who is behaving in such a way that can induce a second, uh, a second wave or can induce resurgence? I, I, I'm not sure that we've understood the, the different groups in the population that are actually driving 
the um, the pandemic, and I think more research on that is 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 uh, is needed. But of course, there are lots of questions: uh, oh, the role of children, the understanding of the immunity. I mean, there are lots of things. So, it's not a clear cut. No. Gianpaolo, did you have a question? Scalia Tomba, come out. <laughs> Well, it's not. We've, we've kept you rather long, Daniela, so I think we should... Sorry, I kept you rather long. I have to say that I'm very tired. So when I'm tired, I go slowly, and I, it took too long for me to... Uh, anyway, but no, but no, but that wasn't to come to you, but, but, but I think we had some good questions, and so it's just say thank you very much, and we will conclude the proceedings. And, we, and as I said to the other speakers today, we hope you will find time to keep involved in the programme and we will try and make sure you have the information so if you have any spare time you can get involved a bit. Okay. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.